Next, we are going to discuss um, a Sidney Poitier movie, um, or most likely known for Sidney Poitier. It's called Raisin Sun, and it was distributed in 1961. A Raisin in the Sun is a film adaptation of Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun and later directed by David Susskind. Donald Bogle, who does a lot of research on black imagery in film, describes Raisin in the Sun as disorganized integrationist drama. And we'll discuss um, history and how being an integrationist or assimilationist at this time was frowned upon. Again, the major player of this film is Sidney Poitier. He is described by many critics as an integrationist and assimilationist, that he took roles that would appease white audiences. And often, um, again, with assimilation, black people would have to do whatever makes the white man happy. Poitier, um, at this time, became the most successful, acclaimed, and accepted black actor in America and also over the world. At the time, at this time, the civil rights movement and the message of nonviolent protest, assimilation, were at, the, um, were at their height, and he became um, the on-screen wish fulfillment of liberal whites in America to make sure that they knew and felt justified that integration was not only just, but safe. Again, Sidney Poitier, has, in his films, has come across as a person who can rise above anything, um, fulfilling the Horatio Alger myth and the idea of meritocracy, if you just try hard enough, that you can make it. In addition, his films have been um, criticized as being a cure or excuse for whites and their racism. So again, the roles of Sidney Poitier were satisfying to white liberals and the black middle class. Again, not much racial conflict occurring in most of these films. Sidney Poitier was not only an actor, he was also a producer and director. As an actor, he was the first black man to win an Academy Award. Um, as a producer and director, he sought to make commercially successful films that would appeal to urban black audiences and be more reflective of the black experience than either the Hollywood race films of the 1950s and 60s and also how it, um, how it was going with black exploitation during the 70s. Again, his films were reactions to black exploitation films later called explo exploitation films because they later were not directed by um, black people. They weren't black films for black people anymore. So in terms of cultural context, what's going on at this time, again, we're moving away from the 1950s, early 60s assimilationist and integrationist goals. Um, many black or African Americans at the time were tired of nonviolent messages. They saw that they were not making any progress. They were not successful. Instead, now they're shifting towards more militant and separatist messages. And we can see this through the um, Student um, Nonviolent Coordinating Committee later on in the later 60s, um, headed by Stokely Carmichael, later becoming a, later, um, a leader of the Black Panthers. And um, a phrase often used during this time was black power. It was not necessarily to, to promote hate against whites. It was to have self-defense, self-sufficiency within the black community. During this time also, the Monaghan Report was published. And it had two um, interpretations. One said that the civil rights legislation alone would not and could not produce racial equality. So again, laws do not necessarily equate to behavioral and heart changes. Um, but also, the other side was that it was a critique on the black family structure, especially that many of these families were not two-parent households, many led by women, um, women who had work, and again, their children were seen as delinquent because no one was watching them. 
So again, the, the positive side is that civil rights legislation could not do enough. And the other side is um, blaming the victim, that they just need to change their culture. They need to do better. They need to get a better education. They need to focus on work um, to overcome their struggles. So again, blaming the victim. During this time, a lot of um, racial upheavals and riots occurred. Um, and this was due to assassinations of many um, progressive leaders, um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and President, Jeff, um, the President John F. Kennedy. Um, Martin Luther King was ass assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee on April 4th, 1968. He was a Baptist minister and a founder of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And from the mid-1950s, Dr. King led the civil rights movement using nonviolent tactics and, of course, his very powerful voice. Um, his goals were achieve significant civil, and voting, uh, civil rights changes and voting rights advances for African Americans. However, his assassination led to an outpouring of anger among black Americans, leading to riots in more than 100 cities across the country. Malcolm X was another leader during this time. Instead of being a, seen as an assimilationist or wanting integration, he was more towards the side of separatism. He was a member of the Nation of Islam, which advocated black nationalism and racial separatism and condemned Americans of European descent as immoral devils. Malcolm X's views were in contrast, again, with Dr. King's views. Um, a later... Um, while in the Nation of Islam, he was suspended by Elijah Muhammad for being too powerful. And later he started his own group. Um, his, later started his own group to also promoted a black unity. Uh, Malcolm X was assassinated February 21st, 1964 by rival black Muslims while addressing his organi organization of African American unity at the Audubon Ballroom in Washington Heights. The killings of both Dr. King and Malcolm X radicalized many moderate African American activists, fueling the growth of the Black Power Movement and Black Panther Party in the 1960s and 1970s. President um, John F. Kennedy um, was assassinated November 22nd, 1963 in Dallas, Texas by Lee Harvey Oswald. Dr. Uh, uh, President Kennedy was making a lot of progress in establishing uh, civil rights amendments that would help Americans across the country. Um, again, there's a lot of speculation and um, myths about his death, whether it was a conspiracy theory and that Lee Harvey Oswald was not the only person involved in his assassination. So during this time, after Lyndon B. Johnson um, became president, he was again the vice president of JFK, um, we saw a very Civil Rights Act passed in 1964. We finally see access to public facilities for all people, regardless of race. And in 1965, we saw Voting Rights Act passed that assured that people um, could also vote without restrictions. So to the film again, Raising the Sun, major themes that we saw here is poverty. This story takes place in South Side Chicago and um, South Chicago is still known as a, a place of concentrated poverty and um, primarily um, those who reside there are African American. We see a family structure here also being a um, single woman household. Um, so this family is led by a matriarch. And within this theme, we see the idea of emasculation. Um, the character here, Walter Lee, is, is seen as, um, as a beggar um, trying to do what he can to, to help lead the family. But the women supposedly get in his way. He's seen as emasculated by not being able to provide for his family. So again, we see emasculation of black male by a white hostile society, a racist society, and unsupported black women within his own household. 
Another theme is upward social mobility into white suburbs. So the idea of making it is moving out of a high rise, probably project into your own home that you own in the suburbs. So in terms of theory, if we look at this from an intersectional perspective, we can see how race, class, and gender all work within the film. Race, again, we see it's primarily a, a black film or with black characters, black stories and their experiences. And we see how even if they are trying to do what's right according to American standards, um, they have opposition from whites who want to keep their standard of living the same. Be it that they have fear of blacks, you know, for very stereotypical reasons, or that they'll lose their own position in a racialized hierarchy. We have emphasis of here meritocracy, trying to move up in social class. So moving from a chauffeur to the next stage, whatever that may be, but also owning your own home. That's one sign of moving into at least a middle class position. And then gender. Women are in a subordinate role here, although they're the leaders of the family. The men are at least given um, a kind of superficial title of leader of the family. Although here we have both women here working as well as the man. White supremacy is evident in the film as well. We see residential segregation where we have a white um, member of this housing covenant coming in and he's speaking on behalf of the, the neighborhood saying that they don't want black people in, you people in. They want to keep things the same. So they just have a lot of fear and will use whatever they can, even paying more than what the house is worth to make sure that no one unlike themselves moves into that neighborhood. We see assimilation here. We see it first in the daughter doing what it takes to become a doctor, to, to define what is good and appealing and prosperous and any kind of occupational standard in the United States. We also see assimilation and trying to, to do what it takes to be um, what, what's good. So a homeowner in the suburbs rather, um, rather than a person who is making it in an urban environment. And this leads into uh, to internal racial oppression where we see that when the family loses the money, that they feel downtrodden, that they now are not good enough to move into the white suburb. They're not good enough to try to go to medical school. They're not good enough to be a good example of a man for the son. We see escapism also trying to, to escape from whatever oppression may be, be it from white supremacy, be it from um, poverty. And in this case, um, we see alcoholism here. One, drinking your worries away, drinking your problems away, and also wanting to buy into a liquor store, which would um, poison your own community. But again, it makes you rich or more wealthy, and the other people continue to drown in their poverty. Some implications that are still relevant today. Family. So we have the idea that the... A good type of family is a nuclear family with a mother and a father and some kids. But we see here a different type of family. We see an extended family. We see that we have a mother, father, a son, also living with his sister and living with his mother. So we have extended family. And um, we see that still today and especially in communities of color. We see also here issues of black masculinity and patriarchy that we still combat today. And we have traditional representation of masculinity, that the man should be the provider, should be the leader of the house. And if the man is not the leader, we see um, delinquency of children. We can see failure in that they're not moving up socioeconomically, just more problems when it's not the traditional family type. We also see an attempt to move from black bucks, toms, and coons to the sanitized bourgeoisie black Superman. So that's what uh, Poitier was described as again. Like, if you do these right things, these things right, 
it'll, you'll overcome your problem. But if you are like these stereotypes, that is the cause of your problems. If you are overly sexual, if you are just an entertainer, if you're just trying to kiss up to the white man, then that is the problem. We also see here that black audiences wanted black heroes who are not made for white audiences. They wanted someone they could relate to in their community who may have gone through similar experiences. And we see still today, and, and meritocracy is what this is also called, the Horatio Alger myth, that if you work hard enough, you can come, come across or come over any problems that you may have had that you just need to try hard enough. But we see in our own experiences and experience of others that not all that try hard make it. We see the intersection of race and class here that we still see people of color being con um, held into areas of concentrated poverty and that we have two oppressions, race and poverty. And when you talk about intersectionality of different identities, white privilege can mask class oppression. Not to say that it makes up for it, but it's different. And we see in the film representation of the uh, black poor is perpetuated as black people who are in poverty as shiftless, mindless, lazily, dishonest, and unworthy that they deserve whatever they get. We see that black people are covetous of wealth. In the film, we see them wanting to harm their own community by buying a liquor store. And we can see that in our own um, experiences and history here where black people will fight for things like sneakers or whatnot. Um, we also see self-contempt where they don't like themselves if they don't have certain things or not in certain positions. And again, this is just internalization of white supremacy and oppression of the poor. So if we look at Bell Hooks, again, she writes a lot about film and the intersection of race, class, and gender. She says this, Poverty was no disgrace in our household. We were socially early, socialized early on by grandparents and parents to assume that nobody's value could be measured by material standards. Value was connected to integrity, to being honest and hardworking. One could be hardworking and still be poor. My mother's mother, Baba, who did not read or write, taught us, against the wishes of her parents, that if it was better to be poor than to compromise one's dignity, dignity that was it was better to be poor than allow another person to assert power over you in ways that were dehumanizing or cruel. Indeed, the poor are portrayed through negative stereotypes. When they are lazy and dishonest, they are consumed with longing to be rich, a longing to, so intense that it renders them dysfunctional, willing to commit a man, all manner of dehumanizing and brutal acts in the name of material gain. The poor are portrayed as seeing themselves as always and only worthless. Worth is gained only by means of material success. So we need to analyze television and movies still today with these things in mind. We need to think about black masculinity and how that's limited. Also we need to focus on the black family structure. Does it have to look like the traditional um, nuclear family with a mom and a dad to be a healthy family? How was poverty represented? What does it mean to be poor? in America. Is upward social mobility still a goal? And are the ways to getting to the end, the means to the, get to the end, justifiable? What do you have to sacrifice to move up? And what does it mean when we internalize these messages that we have to look like what we see in television and movies? Is blackness only acceptable this way? Is the family structure only acceptable this way? What does it mean to be a man or a woman? And are you following those representations?